people and a hero I will show. He is the West Coast logger, been here a hundred years or so. He came into this country where the Douglas fir does stand. He was the first in all the earth such timber to command. These trees are measure of the man and strength not just in size. He stemmed from many countries, shares with the world his prize. He looked for work with steel in hand and made a forest fall. Oh, where the tree dwells, you can hear his warning timber call. Eight Day Wilson, Rough House Pete. The day of the big log jam. Get enough loggers in a mood to remember and you begin to get a picture of logging's romantic past. What do you remember? The unheard of punctuality of the train that brought you to this country. That's what you remember best. the day even more remarkable, the crummy that took you to the camp was on time as well. You remember thinking at the time how strange to call a bus a crummy. And after riding in it over makeshift logging roads, how adequate a term it was. You were one of thousands of loggers that flowed into British Columbia from all parts of the world. And you remember thinking it smelled like new country. The air was a little heavy, pungent with an aroma that came from a mixture of salt water and wood smoke. You had come to this rugged and at first inhospitable land in the hopes of getting rich and getting out. But you stayed. There was nothing new about a logging camp except perhaps the size of them. Everything was so big. But that was it. Everything was steamed up on a grand scale, and the acrid green fur smell accentuated the activity. The hauling of logs of huge size and enormous weight through all the obstacles and pitfalls of the woods. The sudden shivering shock to the machine, and the log jammed behind a solid stump or rock, and the hauling cable tautens with a vicious jolt. The old steam donkey engine was a mechanical wonder. monster within seemed always upon the very point of bursting from its fragile metal covering. Yes, now that you come to think about it, it was new country. Still pioneer country, with rough, uncouth edges, plainly visible. strange mixture of Scandinavian, Scots, and Irish, the odd French-Canadian and turbaned East Indian, and plenty of Chinese. The country bristled with opportunities for loggers, opportunities that were the making of men who had the spirit to venture out and seize them. Many a man you've heard lament those days. Boys, oh boys, why was we all so slow in coming to this country? We'd heard talk of it, and yet we held back.
When they write about this time in history books, they'll call it the end of an era, the culmination of the romantic past. But in the hearts and minds of those who lived and worked with it, it was a way of life. Finally, you were seeing what the loggers in Vancouver had told you about. And places like Powell River, Alert Bay, Minstrel Island, Night Inlet, and all the vast forests and logging shows were becoming commonplace. It was a fairy tale of outlandish proportions. The Loki does fine as she makes the incline makes it both puff, snort, and blow. It would unman your nerves as she slides round the curves. I tell you, boys, that is a show. That old, torn, and dirty photograph can stir a flow of nostalgic memories. But these aren't your memories. They belong to the loggers that worked in these woods long before your time. They were old when you were young, and their tales made your head spin. They told you of the first bunkhouses. Dirt floors, leaky roofs, single pot-bellied stoves, and 15 to 25 loggers crowded into one small room. They told you of loneliness and solitude, of silence and isolation. The camps had improved by the time you arrived in the bush, but they were never a home. In the days of oxen, you had the bow whacker and teams of bulls brought from great distances to wrestle tons of weight down the skid roads. You had the punchers who spent their off hours nailing on shoes, two plates to each cloven hoof. You had the skid road builder who laid out the roads. And when steam came in and spar trees went up, there was the head rigger in charge of hanging blocks and lines, the hook tender in the bull gang who bossed the choker men out where the trees were felled and bucked. If there was a railroad taking the logs out, it had an engineer and full crew. Every camp had a saw filer, a blacksmith, a carpenter, first and second cooks, bull cook, and perhaps a fire patrol. Here were bunkhouses, cookhouse, company store, and blacksmith shop. And here was always a long day's hard work. Food, which had to be abundant and good, or the men would leave. An hour or two at a card game in the kerosene lamp gloom, and then deep sleep. And the next sound would be that of a highball boss shouting, Daylight in the swamp! You heard tales of Roughhouse Pete, Stub Dylan, Eight Day Wilson, and Soapy Smith, and a hundred other transients that moved in and out of the camps. More logging was done within the walls of the bunkhouses than in all the woods of British Columbia. And what happened to the old-time logger of fiction? The Canadian Paul Bunyan, who labored for half a year and spent his wages in the orgies of Vancouver's houses of ill repute. Maybe the times are to blame. Spending one's stake was then a universal and respected pastime. It was a reckless age, a prodigal age, a mad age, if you will. But who will deny that it was an age worthwhile?